House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. We got Mr. Dave Martino. Hello, hello. Hey, Al. <laughs> you said that cautiously. What's going on over there? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think something's Making me on. nervous, Al. I think that's well, what it is. You have, I think something's going on and you're not telling me. You know, <laughs> something, something. Well, it's your birthday's coming up the weekend. So, right, you're, oh, you're no. 73? Yeah, yeah, just about, right? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you're 51. 50, I mean, 52. No. Actually, 52. 52. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always forget <laughs> the age as well. I stopped remembering back in, I think, when I was 57 or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'll be 39 for what, the 13th time? It's like Jack Benny. Yeah. <laughs> you keep saying Jack Benny. I Jack keep telling Benny. you, there's not a listener alive who <laughs> <Jack laughs> remembers <laughs> Jack Benny. I was just watching his shows, too. It's funny because, um, but I, I think about things like that. And, yeah, you know, come on. We just, we mentioned uh, to uh, that horror guest a while back um, about um, Austin Powers, and they didn't oh, know yeah, who that was. That's right. <laughs> Austin Powers. <laughs> Who's They're that? not going to know Jack Benny, you know. Well, I'm old at heart, Al. Yeah, I'll say. That's what it is. <laughs> I'll say. Some old somewhere. Anyway, um, now, <laughs> see, that would be my segue. I was supposed to say, speaking of old, but that's not, no. Um, so now we're going to <laughs> kind of go into a true crime today, and we haven't done that in a while. We've got a big true crime month coming up, too, so... Um, Anyway, so uh, today uh, we've got an author of a book called 122675, and it's Tony Reed. So thank you for being here, Tony. Greatly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Tony, so what is going on in your life here? You've got this book out here, and it, it's called, uh, you know, we said 122675. So what's, what's the basic... Um, idea behind this book like what is it well the reason that the book is titled that is it's the date of the homicide in question and in my mind it's the turning point for for what should have been uh a the moment when joseph d'angelo could have been stopped uh before uh he went on to kill uh 12 more uh people uh in california and uh, he's, I think, most well known under the moniker the Golden State Killer. But uh, in essence, uh, in that exact moment of time, uh, he was still a active duty law enforcement officer. He was a sergeant with the Exeter Police Department, and uh, that was his first of two jobs uh, as a peace officer in California. Uh, he went on to serve in Auburn. And, you know, in this, at that moment, uh, Joe D'Angelo had elevated to the rank of sergeant. He was head of a local burglary task force. He was also the head of the violent crimes unit for Exeter PD. So when we think about, you know, what uh, that was like for a police officer to have that level of power, uh, what could you accomplish if your intentions were less oriented towards law enforcement and perhaps more towards crime. So that's really what we're talking about is, is in my mind, this is the moment where things could have and should have turned. And the reason that the date is so important is, is that's the date of the homicide in question. Okay. So now we're talking about the homicide of Donna Joe Richmond. Yes. And um, you say this is, the, this is when it could have turned. Yes. And, and he could have been prevented from, going on to do all the horrendous things he did. Yes. Um, so what do you ascribe the problem? Like, what? why did this go wrong, and why is it that um, he was able to continue on? That's a, that's a really important question. And I think in any examination where something goes wrong, you kind of have to look at the moment where things could have turned and why they went the way they did. And... I think when officers showed up at the scene where uh, Donna Joe's bicycle was found uh, on that date, December 26, 1975, 
that they decided in that moment that they had the right idea for, for who this person was within, within basically within minutes. Uh, they, they thought they knew what the crime was. And really, that is the heart of what happens in a wrongful conviction, is, is this tunnel vision, this obsession with, with uh, uh, the idea that one particular person may have committed the crime. Really, in, in essence, now what we know about wrongful convictions is that we can prevent this by having officers slow down, call for outside help, uh, ask for assistance, make sure that they're double-checking their procedure, and I'm not talking about necessarily second-guessing their decisions, but I'm talking more just about the, the, the basic protocol for how an investigation proceeds, and that's definitely not what happened uh, here in Exeter. We do know is, is that within minutes of showing up, uh, they found at the scene where Don and Joe's bicycle was recovered, they found an invoice book. And that invoice book uh, had Oscar Clifton's name on it and had some writings inside that were definitely his. He never denied that the invoice book was his. What he uh, maintained was that he had no idea how that book got there. The last place he saw it was in Visalia, uh, and that's 15 miles away. So uh, how that book got there is the, cent is the one mystery that, that I can't solve, even after all of the time that I've spent looking at the, at the case. I have a few ideas, but equally important, the other thing that's found at this location, at this time, is a small jotter notepad. Uh, you know, the, the, basically the, the kind of notepad that you would see a police officer have uh, writing down uh, notes for an investigation you know, a uh, three by five size. Uh, and in that notebook, uh, in that notepad, uh, was just basically some uh, numerals, N no handwriting of, of any other kind, just, just some numerals. And the thing that I've been able to establish about that other notepad, we have some photographs of the three pages, so we know what they look like. And that handwriting is a very solid match to the handwriting of Joe D'Angelo. Uh, I have his police uh, reports for the time that he was a sergeant with Exeter Police Department. Um, I've included um, some images of both the notepad itself uh, that was recovered at the scene in Exeter, as well as the numbers that we have from his police reports in Auburn. And um, they're indistinguishable. Uh, the, in, in my mind, you know, that, that's the first thing that we need to look at is to say, you know, was there a nexus between these, uh, individuals? Was he there? Uh, obvious from the fact that this was a violent crime. It was in Exeter and, uh, he had every reason to be called to that scene. Uh, in addition to that, this notepad basically disappears from evidence. Uh, it is, it is introduced at trial. But it's quickly acknowledged uh, by uh, the uh, officers that it wasn't Oscar Clifton's. Therefore, they, they said, well, it has no connection to the crime, and it wasn't investigated or clarified whose notepad that was. So from the very moment this case uh, starts, uh, there, the focus of everything, the, the complete honest investigation of what happened here was over in five minutes, and uh, what happened immediately is that um, evidence starts to move. The scene starts to change, and once the officers decide that they know who did it and they're wrong, uh, that um, things start to move around, and that includes some of the evidence from that scene. You also, I know that you mentioned that... Uh... Uh, you, you kind of mentioned corruption, and you talk about the lead investigator, and that um, you know some of the trial evidence was destroyed yes. and stuff. Um, so when you when you come to that kind of a, an accusation or a statement, uh, d does anything ever really happen to an investigator like that after these years? Do 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 do, uh, do police or does the court ever go back and kind of go, oh well? Um, this person should be punished. Um, what, what's the result of something like that? 
it's so rare. It's shockingly rare. Uh, it, it is becoming a little bit more accepted and commonplace that uh, police officers are mis- misconduct by an officer is at the root of corruption. But this is so new uh, in terms of society's reckoning with this problem. There was a really interesting case in um, Indiana that unfolded uh, in 1982. Uh, a young man was um, hauled out of class uh, as a junior in high school. Uh, he was a promising football athlete, completely uh, innocent uh, of a crime. He was misidentified uh, as being a possible uh, perpetrator. As soon as, uh, and this was related to a burglary and a sexual assault, and as soon as the um, evidence kind of came in that said, wait a minute, this person didn't have any connection to the crime, the officer destroyed uh, some of the uh, exculpatory information, they went ahead and uh, charged him anyway. Uh, he ended up serving his complete term for the crime he did not commit. Then, as soon as he filed suit after he was released, he said, wait a minute, the, the evidence that would have uh, cleared me was destroyed and you did this. As soon as he, he's, he filed suit against the officer, a new charge suddenly appeared from the same department, from the same officer, and they charged him with the murder of a police officer in a nearby town. And so he was then convicted uh, by the same officer by the same corrupt officer who was convicted of this uh, additional homicide and the remarkable part of the story is is that that second conviction was completely manufactured and it was done so simply because he did not want the uh, defendant to um, go through and identify this corruption from the the first instance and just recently just uh, like two months ago this whole matter was resolved. The civil suit was finally allowed to proceed. Uh, he was uh, he has been exonerated of both crimes, the original crime and of the, the homicide. And what we're left with is a very clear picture. This officer was completely uh, corrupt in his investigation, uh, completely manufactured all of the evidence uh, to to convict the person person in the first place. And. His only, uh, and this happened so long after the time of the original crimes that, you know, he'd already retired. He was already receiving his pension. And for all I know, he's still receiving a a pension, even though um, he committed these egregious crimes uh, against an individual. I think what we're left with is the need and uh, the appreciation that there has to be more checks and balances for claims of um, this type of behavior when there is uh, where there is so much implicit trust of police officers, prosecutors, judges, that when an allegation like this is being made uh, against uh, individuals in power, the system, the, the protections that we have now protect the individuals uh, who are in the system. They do not protect the defendants. They do not protect the innocent. That's what our system is supposed to do. It's supposed to have these guardrails. Instead, what we have is a system that uh, just continues to protect uh, those uh, who uh, are capable of corruption and in some rare instances do commit this this type of of action. In my case, uh, the the individual involved was a, a sergeant, detective sergeant, with the local sheriff's uh, office, he should not have been the lead investigator on this crime for the simple fact that the individual who was murdered, uh, Don Joe Richmond, a uh, 14-year-old girl, he was, uh, the, the, the sheriff's detective here, was a close family friend. Um, of course, in a small community, that's likely, but he was more than just that. He was, in essence, her godfather. He had been uh, present at the time of her birth. He worked for the family uh, prior to becoming a law enforcement uh, officer. He was their ranch manager. There were so many deep 
uh, connections. Uh, and for instance, on the stand, when he come, gets up to testify at trial, he talks about his, his close connection and how, uh, and the reason that he, uh, worked so hard on the case was that, you know, he had been such a close family friend for, for many years. That's exactly the kind of individual that you don't want to be the lead investigator. Um, uh, there, there are so many, uh, emotional biases that, that you start to form. And I think very quickly what he realized is that there wasn't enough evidence at the scene uh, to implicate the individual that he thought was involved. Um, and there was another massive problem here, and that is, is that the individual who ends up being implicated in this is, is uh, named Oscar Clifton. Uh, there was a longstanding bias and hatred that existed between those two individuals, an animosity that's documented uh, elsewhere. And, you know, when you've got um, those two elements that are working now together, there's so many <laughs> problems that manifest uh, with, with that kind of activity. How that eventually takes form in corruption is that within six months after the sentence is finally, a death sentence is finally given to, to Oscar Clifton, uh, the detective uh, in question here had ordered the case evidence to be destroyed. Every stitch uh, of, of evidence that was in their possession at the time, uh, important distinction later on in the story, is ordered to be destroyed. All of the physical evidence, all of the biological evidence, he assures that everything is uh, that he thinks uh, that uh, is in, in existence. He orders it to be destroyed. In a capital case, especially, uh, it's very important that evidence is preserved as long as the individual is in custody, as uh, and that can be until the person dies in custody. It can be until they're executed. It can be uh, anywhere. So long as that person's uh, jeopardy, uh, it, their liberty is in jeopardy, uh, it is required that the state preserve the evidence. And for an officer to go out of the way, not just to allow evidence to be spoiled or to, for, for uh, some inadvertent bad uh, action to happen to it, um, that's not bad faith. Uh, what, what happened here is a specific order. Find everything, locate it, destroy it. And, um, you know, that, that sealed, uh, the fate for, for the later DNA testing that could have exonerated Oscar Clifton. We know that there were hairs and fibers. We know that, uh, there were, uh, fingernail scrapings. There were swabs. There were any number of items that could have and should have been in existence. And they were specifically ordered to be destroyed by that same officer. That is absolutely criminal. Uh, and as a matter of fact, California does have a penal code that says explicitly if a um, if case evidence is is destroyed in such a case, that is a capital crime. And one of the things that's important about a capital crime is that the statute of limitations doesn't expire. Uh, in other words, uh, this individual could still be charged if there were anyone who was willing to pick up uh, such an investigation, uh, civil rights violation, um, that person could still be charged. Uh, that, that's, it, it's unforgivable. It really is. Uh, it's, it's incomprehensible to understand what happened in this case, but it's the kind of thing that does happen when, um, something other than your motivation as a law enforcement officer is involved. If there had been some kind of oversight, some kind of um, in other involvement, I don't think the case would look the way it does now. Well, kind of in the same vein, do, do you believe anyone, uh, you know, whether it was Joe D'Angelo or the lead investigator, do you believe anybody planted evidence like the notepad to uh, point towards Oscar Clifton? Is there, is there any evidence to suggest that? Well, actually, you know, it's very interesting uh, that that's one of the main MO points of the East Area Rapist original night stalker as, uh, as an offender. One of the things that, you know, it helps, uh, if you're, if you're a criminal to know how crimes are going to be investigated. And, um, 
there is a there are I want to say at least five or six instances throughout the East Area Rapist series where uh, mysterious items of evidence are taken from one scene and moved to uh, another location. We know that that's something that Joe D'Angelo did uh, as the uh, perpetrator known as the East Area Rapist. Uh, he would move uh, stolen items. Uh, he would break into a home. He would steal uh, items of little monetary value and then leave them um, in a different home. He would leave um, personal possessions. He would take, uh, you know, small uh, items and people would find them in their home and say, what, what is this? Um, for uh, that offender to have simply taken uh, the invoice book from Oscar Clifton's truck, where it was last seen in Visalia, and put that uh, out in Exeter is absolutely 100% understandable, especially given the timing of when that happened. Um, what we're looking at uh, for the crime again, December 26th, Joe D'Angelo uh, was not identified as the Visalia ransacker until he was apprehended in 2018 when he confessed to that crime. Um, what we do know is that uh, in Visalia, the investigators there documented uh, several instances where uh, items were taken from one scene and planted in another. And as a matter of fact, that was one of the things that very early on when I was uh, working with the original lead investigator from Visalia, John Vaughn, uh, that was the one thing that he kept reiterating to say, how did I know that the Visalia ransacker and the East Area Rapist were the same offender? It was this particular habit of taking items from one scene and moving them to another. That's exactly what we have in the Richmond case is this great mystery of how Oscar Clifton's invoice book ended up uh, out in Exeter. We also know that uh, two different uh, items of loot uh, from the Visalia ransacker were taken from Visalia and planted out near Exeter, uh, very close to the scene of this homicide. This was uh, in September, so three months prior to the homicide. But we have items that are actually taken from Visalia and, and found in Exeter. This is not uh, in any way a stretch of imagination to suggest that the same individual did this three times, not just two times. A whole part of this, too, like you, 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 you talk about uh, wrongful convictions and, yes. uh, and kind of how that happens. And, and why it happens and, and, yes. um, and also false confessions. Yes. Right? That's, yes. that's another big part, right? It and is. There's so many of that. But people still don't really buy into that a lot. I, I had this on the show before and talked and I know a lot of listeners still will kind of come back and say, well, how can someone actually confess to something they never did and what? And they kind of have this doubt toward it. So, how do you respond to stuff like that? You know, I, I think the, the for the same reason that torture is not allowed, we're talking about conditions that are very close to torture for uh, the, the individuals that are involved. I think the other thing that you have to understand in some of these cases, uh, you're talking about individuals who don't have enough information about, A, about their rights in the first place. It, the first right that you have is to say, I don't want to talk to the police about anything until I talk to my lawyer. So uh, it, for anyone who's listening, uh, your first step is to say lawyer. Your second step is to say, you know, what is the what is the mental state of, of a false confession? Because a lot of the individuals involved are not of higher capacity. They're, the the you know, low IQ is associated with very problematic confessions. But I think, too, when you start to look at the circumstances of what the false confessions are, you're talking about instances where questioning goes on for the better part of 10 or 12 hours of uninterrupted uh, time uh, and Police officers are not uh, supposed to uh, you know, mislead uh, an individual, but they do. They, they, this is not prohibited. Um, 
uh, in, in actual fact. Uh, they can say, we have uh, evidence that connects you to this scene. You're, you're better off if you tell us now. And in some instances, uh, the, it, it's so close to torture that the individual just says, I, I relent. Uh, you know, I, I think I can go home if I just tell you what you, what you want to hear. Um, the, uh, there, there's a fantastic series, uh, earlier this year on HBO, uh, about, uh, homicide in, uh, Kansas, uh, that, uh, five people ended up, uh, in through different confessions, ended up through the same misconduct, one main lead officer, uh, confessing to, to crime, saying that they were at the location when clearly the DNA evidence uh, said that they were not. There was one single profile and none of the individuals arrested. What ended up happening is they just, the police said, well, if this person's connected, let's find a friend of theirs and maybe they're connected. They get charged. Uh, by the time they were done, they had five people uh, who uh, ended up separately confessing to a crime uh, that they did not commit. How could something so widespread have happened um, and the, it's the same exact problem that I mentioned earlier. It's this tunnel vision. It's this, uh, blind belief that these individuals committed the crime and, uh, we're going to make this stick. Uh, right now, uh, you know, there, there is a move towards, uh, reforming this. And for instance, a, a new, um, element of training for police officers. Uh, is in wrongful uh, convictions. How did these things happen? And Illinois, for instance, has just passed a requirement that all officers take a class in wrongful convictions and assuring that, you know, we don't deal with uh, tainting uh, eyewitnesses. How do we, how do we make sure that the information that we're getting from eyewitnesses uh, it doesn't just say, you know, we want the crime to stick against this person. How do we follow the evidence that actually existed at the scene? And how do we get the correct evidence? That's the correct strategy. That's the right metric that we should be asking. Uh, instead of, I think it was this bad guy. I've had trouble with him before and uh, we're going to run him down and we're going to get everybody to, to agree that that's the person who did it. That's how wrongful convictions happen. And the, the sad reality of that is, is that, you know, when we look at saying, you know, why, why would an officer do that um, when they know that the, the real problem then is, is that the, this other person is allowed to escape the person who, who actually committed the crime and go on and, and perhaps do, uh, do more. The real uh tragedy as well is that the uh, original crime is unsolved and that person has really a, a fake version of justice um, there if, if something happens and that conviction's overturned um, like for instance in the case where I mentioned with with uh, the case in Gary Indiana with this young uh, guy who's hauled out of class in junior in high school um, railroaded through the system and has now not just He's the only person in the National Registry of Exonerations to be listed twice, uh, for, first for that original conviction and then for this homicide of the police officer. It's kind of shocking that um, he's now on the, on the Registry of Exonerations twice. And, you know, the sad thing is, is that if you look at, um, I think it's like the Fallen Blue uh, website, uh, the, the officer's uh, case is still listed as solved because there was a conviction against this guy. And what's the sad reality is, is that that conviction was never valid. His, his case is completely unsolved. When we are looking at the victims of um, wrongful convictions, it's not just the person who ends up in prison. It is uh, the, the fact that a false justice was rendered and the, the victim of the crime uh, is left now wanting real justice. I know that the people of Exeter have, have, I've received multiple emails. I've had conversations with locals and there is definitely a mixed set of emotions about uh, the book 
uh, and about the facts and circumstances revealed here. There are a number of people who are saying, you know, your books had a real impact on the community and people are, are, uh, concerned that, uh, the, there was not real justice here and that the, the killer has not been held accountable for the crimes that, and we're left with the pain too of this, of the wrongful conviction. That's what happens when the justice system jumps too quickly and makes these kinds of mistakes. This is, this is the painful legacy of wrongful convictions. This is why this has to be stopped. Uh, why we can't just jump on some evidence, any evidence, why we can't just jump on some defendant, any defendant. Yes, when, when a horrible crime like this happens, when there is a brutal homicide, we all want justice, uh, to, to be held. Uh, for instance, like in the, in the case of the, the four, uh, people in Moscow, uh, Idaho, uh, who are, were murdered there and, and we're looking at now at this, uh, suspect, Brian Kloberger, uh, Everyone should be making sure that the evidence is correct, that we know exactly who did it, and that his rights are preserved, uh, that he receives a fair trial, and that we don't just jump to say, well, we know who did it now, we've got this, we've got this DNA lead. Uh, what we're required to do is to go through all of the steps, make sure that his rights are protected as to get a fair trial so that everybody gets the correct answer. If we don't, we'll end up with a different problem. Now, uh, I, I guess um, now the person that was convicted of it was uh, what Oscar Clifton. Yes. And so uh, now I guess there's been DNA about him and I guess he a yeah. possible match to what was found on the victim, but D'Angelo they say isn't. So, um, right. What, what do you say about that? Like, how, how do you explain that? So what this is, this, when, uh, I first got involved in this, I said, you know, hey, look, I, I think there's a, there, there's a wrongful conviction here and approached, uh, the DA's office and approached the attorney general's office and said, this needs to, uh, a careful reexamination. What's supposed to happen when a complaint like that originates is there's supposed to be uh, involvement uh, with uh, defense and investigators, and there's supposed to be an opus and honest evaluation of the the case evidence. That didn't happen. Um, instead, what happened is uh, the, the DA's office got a hold of uh, the, the 2011 testing that was done. Oscar Clifton had put in a, a, a demand for uh, DNA testing as soon as California passed its uh, law uh, to allow uh, what's called the 1405. Uh, it, it allows uh, any individual who's incarcerated to have uh, DNA uh, evidence tested. So what happened here was uh, when he put in his uh, request, first, um, the state denied that any of the evidence still existed to be tested. And uh, ultimately, uh, after, I want to say, six or seven years of legal wrangling, um, some slides uh, were found uh, to be uh, at the original lab. And these were hair comparison slides. These weren't um, collected as part of the evidence. These were things that, in essence, as things were sent to the lab, uh, different items were picked off and examined. And, and the person went through, he was a um, hair comparison expert. So what he did is he, he gathered up all of these different items and he created, I think it was a total of 46 different uh, slides uh, for, for his purposes. What he found was is that none of the evidence uh, that he uh, was asked to examine would have implicated uh, Oscar Clifton. In other words, none of the uh, victim's hairs were found on the defendant. None of the defendant's hairs were found on the victim. And so, you know, he gave that as his testimony, but he kept these slides. And after a careful examination, when they said, hey, wait a minute, where is the biological evidence? It's supposed to be here. Everyone runs around in a flurry and says, well, what, what do we still have that could be tested? What could satisfy um, Clifton's right to a 1405? So uh, they find these slides uh, in Berkeley. And uh, they're bundled together. 
Uh, and the most important point about the original case and about the examination is the question of whether or not there was a sexual assault. Because, uh, in other words, for this, imp- for this evidence to have any meaning, for the DNA to have any meaning, there would have had to have been um, some kind of evidence uh, for, uh, of a sexual assault that also the biological evidence of that matched Oscar Clifton. Um, in 1976, that was done by blood typing. What we do know is that the material that was tested uh, from the uh, and collected before it was destroyed uh, was ex- ex- submitted and examined for blood type. And at grand jury, one of these criminalists specifies that uh, it was type A uh, that was found on this material. When we look at Oscar Clifton's blood type, it's an O. That is completely exculpatory. When we look at the um, integrity review uh, document, there is an absolute demonstrable lie about that evidence. Uh, and that is, is that there, uh, what they say uh, in their report is that there was no blood typing done. It's right there on page 56 of the grand jury testimony. The criminalist says it's type A. What should have happened is, is that should have been uh, illuminated at trial. Uh, and for whatever reason, defense counsel either forgets about it, doesn't do it, or is not interested in doing a good job for his client. Whatever the reason was, I don't know, but uh, it is not introduced at trial. It's not in the transcript. But there it is, clear and plain and simple. It's also in the test results. Uh, It's in the bench notes. Uh, We have a a type A on there, not a type O. So there's your first indication that something's terribly wrong with this. Second indication is that in 2011, when this evidence is being examined, um, a partial DNA profile is produced uh, on that slide. And what that is, it's a slide uh, labeled VPH. Victor Paul uh, Hank, and uh, that stands for Victims of Pubic Hair. What that slide is was a small collection of the hairs uh, that were found, and they were mounted to a slide, and then uh, they were examined for uh, uh, DNA. When the criminalist is going through and conducting his analysis of that, um, he does what's called a Christmas tree stain on that slide. And he's looking, he uses that as a way to say, is there any indication of uh, human uh, spermatozoa, seminal fluid, anything like that, that would have been consistent with a sexual assault. So uh, the in order for there to be the conclusion that the DNA that was on the slide was related to a sexual assault. You have to say that, you know, I swabbed the hairs and I found um, a component of the seminal fluid. This Christmas tree stain is applied to materials and it will, the reason it's called that is, is the head will light up in red and the body will light up in green. So it looks like a Christmas tree. And anything that's another precursor to uh, seminal fluid will light up purple. In the notes, in the bench notes for this examination, there the, the criminalist makes it clear that there is no seminal fluid. There is no indication of any semen. But he goes ahead and he runs the test anyway on, on uh, the hair itself. What we do know is that there were three allele locations, three allele profiles that were developed. One of those would not be consistent with Jody Angelo. All three of them would be consistent with Oscar Clifton. That sounds damning. However, the main point of any examination like this is that we have to know what the source of the materials 
actually was, what was being tested. And what we do know is, is that the condition of these things, all 46 of these slides were all bundled together. And the way they were collected is uh, this person who was going through and doing the hair analysis had out all of the different hairs for, related to the case all at the same time. He was mounting the slides and manufacturing things. We don't know what that material was. We don't know if it was one of Oscar Clifton hairs that inadvertently got mixed in with the victim's hair. All he's doing is a hair analysis. It could have been uh, epithelial uh, skin cells. It could have been uh, any number of things that was a cross-contamination that resulted in that profile. The one thing we do know is, is that it was not semen. It was not in any way related to a sexual assault. And that would be required for that conclusion to be reached. What is actually astounding about that uh, same DNA report that the uh, prosecutors are using uh, in this matter, there are two, there are two uh, really imperative points to understand. One is that there was documented contamination in that evaluation process. Uh, every time a DNA test is run, you're required to do not just the main body, but a confirmatory test that there wasn't any contamination uh, in the process. You want to make sure that what you're testing is actually just the item of evidence and not anything that came floating in from the room or uh, from the analyst himself or anything else. So you want to make sure that everything is pure and you're only getting uh, the case evidence tested. There is a uh, uh, an allele bump uh, in uh, what's called the reagent blank, what's supposed to be pure, it should be all zeros. Um, and when you have an, uh, an actual identified uh, allele uh, sequence uh, in your reagent blank, that means you have contamination. Something else got in the room at the same time, and it shouldn't be there. And your whole test needs to be redone at that point. Your test is scientifically invalid. It belongs in the garbage can. That happened in this case. There was not enough material left over to redo the test. What the criminalist should have said was there is uh, no conclusion that can be made. There was accidentally contamination. He failed to document that. It is in the bench notes, um, and you would need the bench notes in order to confirm that. I've offered uh, that this has been provided to the attorney general's office many times, and they're just simply shrugging their shoulders and saying, too bad. Uh, the, that's, that's exactly the, the problem here that's at the root of this. Um, we have that along with the fact of this A uh, and O blood type mismatch. And um, when we're looking at this again, there, because there was no sexual assault um, and there was no evidence of a sexual assault, all that was created this confusion in the first place was what's uh, a positive precursor test. There was, in fact, acid phosphatase reaction, but an acid phosphatase is simply to say, is phosphatase present? Phosphatase can be found in citrus peel. It can be found in soil. It can be found in all sorts of different things. It's the way that you establish whether or not in this huge uh, bed sheet, where do I look for spermatozoa? You apply the phosphatase, but you have to do the confirmatory test. In this case, the confirmatory test said no semen. In this case, the confirmatory test had actual contamination in the reagent blank. It belonged in the garbage can. But moreover, the conclusion at the bottom of this report, the criminalist says no analysis can be done. No conclusion can be drawn from this report. That same report is the one that the DA's office are using to both exonerate Jody Angelo and to continue to implicate Oscar Clifton. That is a miscarriage of justice. It misrepresents the report and it lies about the source of the material. It is unforgivable that that is the legal conclusion. If there were an evidentiary hearing, uh, on this matter, that report 
would be dismissed, this matter would be resolved in a completely different fashion. That's not acceptable. So, um, you know, so we're uh, with with Oscar Clifton. So, does he have any options left? Like he's in jail still to this day, right? No, he is not. He's deceased uh, oh. in twenty in twenty thirteen. Oh, oh, yeah. so so that really changes the matter entirely. Um, when you know your rights uh, to a habeas uh, in California and, and, and rights to post conviction relief are go- are done as soon as you are deceased, you die in custody, your your rights are are gone. There is, however, um, one lingering uh, remedy. Oscar Clifton was a veteran. And uh, at, like every veteran, he would have been entitled to not just to veterans' benefits, but to a military burial. That is exactly where his family wants him to be buried. Yeah, his ashes are simply waiting to be interred at this time. And uh, he wants, uh, their family wants uh, a, a burial at a uh, U.S. military cemetery. He's denied that right of the uh, military funeral because any veteran who has a felony conviction for a capital crime is not allowed to be uh, interred in in a veteran cemetery. Um, That means that he still has a liberty uh, that uh, is being denied by the state by by this wrongful conviction. And that's something that's another avenue that we're pursuing at this time. Uh, there is one last lingering hope here uh, for there's one liberty that's still being impaired uh, that, that we can pursue. Do yeah. you think the original um, intention of the uh, prosecutor at, during the crime and the original conviction, was that his intention? Do you think he purposely knew that um, Clifton was uh, probably not guilty or not guilty or whatever, but he just wanted to put him away anyway? It's a very interesting thing because, you know, again, we're looking at 1976, and so you kind of have to get in the time machine and go back to what was going on uh, uh, with all of this. In this instance, um, this particular prosecutor is something of an outlier for the community. Uh, He came into office in 1974. He was a Democrat. Uh, He was formerly the public defender very much inconsistent with the values of this community. Uh, But when we look at 1974, when he came in, um, that was exactly when Watergate was unfolding. And there was a lot of backlash against Republicans, and he barely won uh, his seat. I think he won by by 42 votes uh, and a fairly, you know, uh, thousands of of votes counted. So, you know, less than three, less than a, a percentage point, I think, difference for uh, his opponent. And what ended up happening is, is that he was such a, um, uh, he was viewed as, as being so, uh, someone who would be weak on crime. And so I think in many instances, he kind of overcompensated. He, he tried to, you know, it's, it's kind of like the problem with Democrats and, and, and how they're viewed on the defense. Uh, they they're end up being very hawkish uh, because they don't want to be viewed as being soft uh, on these things. So he was uh, definitely over prosecuting a lot of crimes. He had backlogged the courts so seriously with all of the other crimes. Um, instead of taking plea deals and everything else, he'd really ticked off a huge number of the judges and attorneys and everybody was saying, wait a minute, you know, what's going on here? So I think when this crime crossed his desk, um, there was a real problem on his hands because he did not want uh, this very high-profile crime uh, to, to be uh, uh, seen as that. Right away, you can see p- real problems with uh, his approach in this case. Um, he uh, lies about uh, the sexual assault uh, immediately. Uh, that uh, he misstates the evidence uh, within days. Uh, he knows that, for instance, there was no rape, and yet uh, he puts in the newspaper, as soon as the um, uh, indictment is handed down, he's like he's going after rape charges. Those aren't dismissed until quietly, right before grand jury, when it's changed to an attempted rape. But he's so tainted the community with his high-profile press statements 
Um, he's he's lied about the evidence uh, from the very outset. And I think the other interesting thing to, to know about this prosecutor is that the murder conviction that was immediately prior to the to the Clifton case starting was overturned for prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, his office was, again, misstating uh, evidence uh, and uh, leading the jury to false conclusions. So, you know, do you have an overzealous prosecutor? Yes. Do you have someone who's being, um, you know, demonized in the community for being soft on crime? Yes. Do you have all of these factors that, you know, make a, a, a prosecutor uh, want to do something like this? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Now, at this point, do you have um, social media? I see you've got a yes. podcast as well and, of course, the book. So. Uh, how do you want people to find out about you or connect with you or um, give out all your information here? Sure. Uh, there's a lot more information about the case uh, and about the book, the background on the website, which is the same name as the book, 122675. Um, there are social media as well, a uh, very active uh, Facebook group, thousands of followers, and the podcast itself has 42 episodes, uh, some of them multi-parts. Uh, all of the evidence is broken down. Everything we've talked about today, about everything from what does a conviction integrity review look like? What, sh what should this be? Uh, what, uh, if, what does prosecutorial misconduct look like? Why does it happen? Um, what happened in this case? What was the actual evidence? You can hear... From the actual police reports, you can, um, some of the images of those are on the website and social media. So that's the best way to engage with this. Of course, um, there's an author page on Genius Books. Uh, you can find out more information there. Um, and, you know, check out some of the reviews. I think you'll find that, that people are very moved by the emotional part of the book, which is that you know, a wrongful conviction has happened here and not all of them can be remedied. And we're left with this mixed bag, this, this terrible legacy uh, of, of in, in essence, uh, an unsolved crime. And we have another homicide that uh, happens about the same place, about the same time. Her name was Jennifer Armour and uh, very much strongly consistent with the same uh, actions. Uh, I think this was another unsolved D'Angelo crime. Okay, we'll have all that up on our website as well, so people can find you and find your podcast and book, and it's uh, certainly worth looking into. So, now, of course, the book is called 122675, and I guess so is the podcast. Our guest, Tony Reed. Thank you for being here. Alan, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to get the word out. Thanks, Tony. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.